Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Fenced In podcast, where Ben and I, two GB foilists and coach and student, are talking about ways to continue training for fencing in lockdown. This week, we've got another special guest, Keith Cook from Sal Holyrood in Edinburgh, GB team foilist, an A grade medalist, Scotland's most decorated fencer, and a parent to the UK's youngest ever major winner in inverted commas. Um, <laughs> how are you doing, Keith? How are you doing, Ben? Fantastic, thanks. Good to see you guys. Yeah, likewise, Keith. It's such a pleasure to have you on, and and that is that is actually a relatively short introduction to actually all of the uh, the things that you you have in 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 your in your CV. And and Chris and I certainly have had the pleasure on many occasions to 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 work with you and to compete with you and be on a team with you and things like that. So it's uh, it's great to, great to have you on. How, how are things uh, north of the border? How are things in Scotland? It's it's good. Well. Um... It's a little bit different, as you can imagine, with everything that's going on. I'm used to working from 6.30 in the morning till 9.30 at night. And all of a sudden, uh, at the end of March, it's a standstill. So, of course, I had to try and find myself jobs to do. And uh, my wife's kept a good day to-do list for me. Uh, so I've been working through that. But, yeah, um, things are uh, ticking along. And it's good to see light at the end of the tunnel in uh, Scotland. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I've seen on, uh, on Twitter and on your YouTube channel that you've been doing quite a lot of DIY to your garden and your garage. So you've basically got uh, a fencing centre at home now, right? Yeah. So, of course, it, it might have been a bit of a panic when uh, lockdown uh, first uh, commenced. But I had to logically think, what can I do for when things start back? Because schools might not be open, but what can I do? So it's trying to like control the controllables. So my garden and garage basically was a mess. So, uh, first of all, I, I had to floor the attic, put everything from the garage into the attic. And now my floor, uh, sorry, my garage now is a mini gym and a mini sal. It's got everything there. And um, yeah, I've de- decorated it with very old masks that I found on eBay and things. But yeah, it's, uh, it's kept me busy. Yeah, I was going to say, you've actually started like a collector now with some of the stuff I, I've uh, I've seen. I've actually, I've been to Keith a couple of times and um, I, I've been into the garage to re- to, to get stuff and, and things before. Um, and um, it, it, it was a bit busier in there beforehand, but now it looks like this this kind of mini centre of excellence. Yeah, so, so it's kept me busy as well so that I could give uh, the kids uh, lessons as well and have little team matches with the family. A foil epi and saber as well because Jamie and uh, my daughter uh, Imogen have never fenced saber and epi before so um, it was quite funny to show them different aspects uh, of it uh, have fun as well and I've been keeping very fit this is probably the fittest I've been since my mid 20s uh, so with the with the whole routine of lockdown you know you've been exceptionally busy but i think british fencing um you know and scottish fencing as well have have benefited hugely from kind of this space because it, it wasn't just a, a small diy project that meant that you and the kids could fence but actually uh, you've been and, and for the club for sal hollywood there's been a lot of youtube stuff that's gone up of you demonstrating different plyometric exercises different pad hitting exercises different warm-up stretching routine it's been hugely beneficial to like the whole community yeah, thanks. Um, so, of course, it's fantastic being able to fence, but so many of us have not been able to do that. So I've been trying to motivate and encourage the kids uh, to um, stay focused in the sport. It's having like a positive direction, let's say. So I've been able to use this space and I started uh, a YouTube channel, uh, Keith Cook 81 And this has been to do certain warm-ups, speed and agility, flexibility, coordination exercises, um, try new things that I've never tried before and then post them onto YouTube and see what people think of them, especially the the technical aspects as well. It's fantastic being able to fence someone and get that interaction. But at the moment, we have to think about different ways to perfect our technique by yourself. Mm. And of course, that's such a hard thing to do because you need that reaction from uh, your opponent as well. But I had the boxing bag, I was coming up with different combinations and it's just trying to find different ways to actually keep everybody motivated, being truthful, Ben. It's really interesting what you mentioned about trying to improve your technique and things by yourself um, and having to be really disciplined with that because like you, I've actually, I've taken inspiration from the YouTube channel on, on kind of blade work exercises, so holding 
you know, another blade in my left hand to, you know, to simulate being able to do beats and go around the blade and stuff, which is really handy. But also, so my hitting pad is like a P, an old piece of carpet, like quadrupled over onto a piece of MDF. So it's not quite the right height. It's not quite the right space, but it, it kind of makes do. And Ben and I had our first lesson again last week. And it was so because you and suddenly you feel the difference between hitting a board by yourself and again, going blade first and having all the right reactions and shoulder relaxed and everything. It was a bit squeaky, but it was, uh, you know, I think it was good enough. But it again, it it's really easy when you're doing stuff by yourself to just convince yourself that you're doing everything perfectly and right. And just that, you know, that reminder is really important. And, but when doing these exercises, it's having a purpose. And that's the, the most vital thing. It's not just hitting a pad but focus on having a purpose on where you're wanting to hit the pad as well and a change of pace. And the difference between actually fencing someone or having a coach, um, when you're fencing, you're able to take subtle cues from your opponent and th then that's how you get that reaction as well. That's when you know to do a counter-attack or step back or jump back um, or hit and block um, or when you're slowly preparing your attack like Garozzo is slowly... Um, like the marching attack and then dropping it on with a soft finish. It's getting these cues that you cannot do um, mm. in the garage. And, but it's about focusing on what you can do. And like I said, it's having that purpose of actually trying to hit the same spot. Yeah, and I think there's definitely kind of a pyramid there, isn't it? The first thing is you've got to go to the pad. You know, you've got to be motivated enough to do something. And then kind of once you're there, know what you're doing. And again, I, I heard an interview with you recently talking about your first competition and then being told to go and hit like 50p in your room, you know, do 50 every day. And I found, again, I found that really, really uh, motivating. So I, you know, every, maybe not every day, but every other day, you know, I did 50 in each line. That was, the, and that was the start of my pad session. And that really helped because again, I, I haven't done proper pad work in years and years and years. And I, again, it's really easy when you're fencing to just dismiss it as something that you might do later. It's not so important. So it, it's really good. I think there's there's a uh, you know one of the things that Keith and I often often talk about uh, when we've got a spare five minutes. You know we talk about the idea of of, of the the purposeful practice like we spoke about, and I'm I'm sure all of us here, certainly three of us sitting around this table, have have um, have read bounce and the idea of the ten thousand hour rule. But it's not just ten thousand hours of kind of just doing willy nilly training. It's it's having that purpose, and I, and I think that people in lockdown as you said, Chris, need to kind of get over that initial hurdle of going to the pad and doing the work or, or going to whatever it is to do that. But then what, what is the purpose? What is the direction in what you're doing? Are you just aimlessly hitting a wall? Are you just aimlessly doing something rather than actually applying yourself and, and, and keeping the focus there? And that, that in itself can be quite challenging. And I know certainly what, with all the things that have gone online recently, sometimes people can get lost in all of the kind of buffet of things there are to do. And sometimes having too much choice makes people um, become indecisive. Whereas actually sometimes having, um, you know, more kind of better guidelines about what you can do. And actually, you know, these are five things you can do. It actually makes it a little bit easier to motivate yourself to go, well, okay, today I'm going to go and do this. And then this is my purpose rather than, oh, well, it's one of a hundred things, which can actually, certainly for me, make me feel a bit demotivated, like, which is where the hell do I start? You know, that can be challenging. Also with this time of lockdown and not being able to fence, it's, understanding that it's okay not to fence. It's okay to step back, focus on other things. Uh, there was a quote I heard, without purpose, we lack direction and meaning in life. So it's trying to find that purpose. And what you can do is go, okay, um, physically, I need to get myself prepared. So quite a lot of the, um, the club now are trying to do 5Ks, but also mentally putting yourself in the right place. In order to do that, it's talking about mindfulness. I talk about mindfulness a lot. But it's the, a buzzword that's up in uh, the schools and in worst it's now. But just going for a walk. What can you hear when you go for a walk? What smells can you feel? Uh, um, smell. What can the air? Is it warm? Is it cold as well? It's bringing in all these different senses and they're realising that you can take your mind away and uh, or focusing in the here and now, in the present, what's actually happening in front of you. And that's where we're too busy worrying about what's happening in the future. What is, is fencing going to start? It's just trying to focus on what's actually happening right now. I think it was quite interesting because my, my sports site, Jonathan Katz, said, actually, how many times do we get in a season, in a career, to actually take four months off of fencing to let all those niggles and ailments, you know, repair? And certainly as a slightly more uh, senior 
senior athlete, let's put it these days, you know, it, it, you do have to let your body recover and repair. And it's actually OK to put down the foil for a bit and you kind of get that emotional alleviation from fencing. You don't feel quite as blinkered going back into fencing and, and having had one of my first lessons, because in England at the moment, we can return to one to one lessons, providing that we, we hit the right uh, boundaries. Um, it was really interesting to kind of go back to it. And I thought I was going to be utter garbage, but actually I felt a lot more fresh in, in my thinking uh, and, and talking about the whole thing with mindfulness. I know that, um, so Keith and I are involved in the, the true athlete project where we work with, um, a, a young, uh, mentee who we mentor. Um, and actually I, I, I would, I'm pretty sure I can say this with a lot of confidence. I'm sure Keith would agree that actually I've learned a lot about myself, um, through the whole process and the journey of, of helping guide someone quite young through, you know, what is the journey of sport, but, a lot of the mindfulness stuff based on that and, and getting a bit more clarity in my mind has really has really helped me as the mentor, not only the mentee. But if we take this right back, Keith, this is something that obviously fencing is a huge passion of yours and something that you kind of started from from a very young age. Kind of give us a bit of an overview um, because it, it has been a long and very successful career. Um, but give us a... Yeah. I like how you say very long. But very long. It's, it's so long. Just going to be a bit <laughs> next year as well. So, yeah. Are you really? God. Can, but can I just say very long is a good thing? Like you, How many thing. Commonwealth Championships have you been to? Five? I think, I think it's six now. Six. Six. Yeah. How many people yeah. go to six Commonwealth? That's very true. That's insane. I know you... one. I think George Liston is, oh, he must be in like a 12 or 13 by now, like that. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, like, fencing has brought me so much in my life. And um, I've been so fortunate with it because when I was younger, I got brought up in a, um, I was born deaf. For the first five years of my life, I couldn't hear a thing. I was born with dislocated tips as well and couldn't walk till I was three. I got brought up in a disadvantaged area of Edinburgh um, and never hardly had a pair of shoes on my feet, being truthful. We were so poor as well. Um, and it was just my mum and the three of us. And luckily, I stumbled into the sport of fencing and it's transformed my life ever since. And like uh, Chris was talking about, a friend told me to go to his uh, local uh, club and I went there and I couldn't believe how amazing it looked. And I think the reason why it looked so amazing is because I seen the potential of being able to transform my life and get into a different world that I wasn't used to. And being able to surround myself around different people, the people you surround yourself around will mold you in a positive or a negative way. So it's really important to find these people uh, that can help you be the best you can be and I felt in this environment it was a fantastic opportunity and um, like Chris was talking about my first tournament uh, I went to my first tournament and uh, I came last and I said what a rubbish sport this is I'm going back to boxing <laughs> well. and uh, my coach said to me at the time he goes Keith do you really expect you were going to win first time unfortunately life's not like that um, you're going to have to learn from the mistakes that you make and he gave me one of the foils and that's when I hit a target uh, 50 times in the morning and 50 times at night. And um, it was purposeful training, like we're doing when you're in the gym and things. But, um, yeah, that's how I got into it. And, and ever since, it's kind of you flourished into, you know, what was, a, a, as we said, an exceptionally gr a great career. And, and how did, what was it like kind of going from, from that moment and transforming to an elite athlete? And as you said, given the background, how did you kind of support everything going through from from literally picking up a sword to being, you know, British champion and 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 you know, uh, international medalist. You know, how did you support all of that journey? I had to set myself goals. It was I wanted to get a British tracksuit. Nice. I remember that one. I was like, how am I going to get that? Okay, these are the stepping stones to get that British tracksuit, and I was able to do that. And and then it was just one stepping stone after another. Really, um, I put the hours in. But being truthful, one setback that I wish I'd changed is I was uncoachable when I was younger. I was defiant. I was angry. And um, I was trying to, I don't know, prove to myself or prove to others what I could actually do. And I had this quite aggressive approach. I couldn't hit anybody with a faint disengage, but I could flick you on the back anywhere like that at the time. <laughs> and so I drew this, uh, everything was second intention, drawing it in parapost, drawing it in parapost. And... Um, I just drew this different style of fencing. Then 
I knew to get to the next stage, I had to change something. And luckily, that's when uh, Sean Walton, who's um, coach, went, Keith, let's go back to basics. Here's the lunge, here's the feet disengage, here's direct and direct compound actions as well, and this is how I want you to move. And um, this is the reason why, that he still wanted me to be creative uh, in that approach. And for the last, oh, since I was 19, I've been in the top 10 in Britain. I've just dropped out this year. I'm just about to turn 40. <laughs> 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 but of course, uh, things have changed now. My goal now isn't to be a world champion, but it's to be... Um, uh, a coach, a mentor, uh, to try and teach people or trying to show them uh, the mistakes that I've made to make their learning curve faster than it was mine. So when did that start? When did, when did you start getting into coaching and wanting to make that transition? Or maybe transition is too strong a word. Maybe it was just a bit of an interest, you know, a bit earlier on. But ha, ha, tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, so Keith, sorry, just a quick interjection. Keith's like a boomerang in fencing, right? He tries to go away from it, and every now and then it sucks him back in. So just as a point of that, I, I've seen Keith go, yeah, you know, I'm going to go and do this, and then he comes back again and just wins something, and it's quite infuriating. <laughs> ben, you, th you got me back into it after, like, four years ago. You guys are the ones that got me back into it for, a, like, a lead-up to um, just after Rio. Well, yeah, I remember having a phone call, didn't we? And it was, was it, I think we'd, uh, for World Champs or something, and, we're, and, and you said, you know, Keith, you come, come, you know, you obviously had a really good season. You got the right results. You're in qualification zone. And you were like, well, you know, I just I came back for this season to kind of see how things were. And then, oh, I'm going to world champs. And you're like, well, you know, it's a long way, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, as we know, and we've mentioned this, this podcast a few times, is that sport is tough. Funding comes, funding goes. And, and British fencing have lived through a particularly tough time after 2016 with um, not very much funding around. There's been... You know, UK sport have been hugely helpful to British fencing in, in, in all of its history, but also there have been private benefactors that have stepped in to, to help us. But for this this kind of small story that I'm mentioning, there was there probably wasn't much funding available, was there, Keith? And actually, you'd come back for a year, you'd got some good results, you qualify for world championships, yeah. and then, you know, we were self-funding that world champs, and it was, you know, can we do this? And so it was a phone call between, I phoned you up, and we had a conversation, and we we, uh, we all made men ends meet, and uh, we went out to uh, to sunny China for a world champs. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. Like you said, uh, I'm basically like a boomerang sometimes as well. But when it comes to the transition from being an athlete to a coach, uh, I was a health and safety consultant. Well, I was a leisure centre manager and then a health and safety consultant. And uh, in 2010, uh, me and Sean started um, a grassroots company called Fencing Fun. I didn't want to go straight into coaching uh, elite athletes. I felt it was more satisfying um, and bigger impact coaching grassroots fencing than building them up, showing them that um, with the, the right mindset and um, hard work ethos, anything is possible. Uh, but you have to believe in yourself and, um, and being shown the right path. So through plastic fencing classes, then we started Sal Hollywood next again year and seen a, an influx of lots of kids uh, enjoying the sport and we're just foil in the club but we've got about 70 members of uh, Sal Holyrood just doing foil in a small uh, gym but I think of course I remember when I first started coaching I found it so hard it's a different world it really is how do you then try to pass over your distance and timing uh, that you're trying to do it's, it's tough and it take, it's just like any skill. You have to practice it. And it's been able to, I've been fortunate to for seven years to have lessons from Jemek and uh, Sean as well. And I've been able to um, create my own style based on Jemek's and uh, Sean's uh, lessons that they gave me. And when I'm given the, uh, the lessons as well, my main thing is I want the kids to be creative. I don't know one want them to be a carbon copy of anybody. But I want them to be them. I just want to say, as a Scottish fencer, having been fencing in Scotland for a while, mostly at kind of Five Nations and the Scottish Open um, for many, many years, I can vouch for, for what Keith is saying. You know, we're, we're always commenting on how basically you've got such a massive radius. You know, you coach basically all of Scotland is the way that we see it. But also <laughs> all the, you know, all the kids that come through, they're not, 
that then fencing isn't based on pure aesthetics. It's on being effective and what works and fun for them. Whereas I think there are so many coaches that can put across, this is what a lunge looks like. This is what a step looks like. This is how you have to do this thing. And there's a big, there's a big element in between of like, do what works for you, which I think comes back to what we said before um, with Ben is around that kind of instinct to hit and kind of make the rest work. So when it comes to lessons, for instance, I think it's like reading music. There's no point reading music and not playing the piano. You have to try to put in a false environment these different aspects of a lesson into an actual practical form, but not just in any practical form. It has to, as I keep talking about, purpose. Don't just hit a go for 15 hits. Some matches don't go for 15 hits. Also, you have to be taken out your comfort zone so you can learn. You have to step out of it. So I have to put them under pressure so they can then let once they're comfortable with everything, how to plug themselves in, how to put on the kit, then I have to make this um, environment for them where there's a purpose. So I do lots of scenarios. So the sessions are all uh, structured. So they come for a certain time. There's a, a, a chat beforehand on how the session is going to go. There's a warm-up. There's a mobility, warm-up, speed and agility, um, coordination exercises, footwork, scenario. Then they can go into free fencing. But it's important that I put them in an environment because when they are actually fencing, this environment is going to happen. They're going to be under pressure. And the more calmer they are, the more opportunities they'll see. And that's why we have 14-year-olds winning sen uh, senior um, men's tournaments and things <laughs> like that. Uh, for one of my highlights so far being a coach is having three Sal Holyrood on the podium at the cadets last year. That's mm. a massive. And they're having fun. They're enjoying it. They're engaged. They want to be there. They want to go on the piste. And they're not scared about it. And that's what fills me with joy. I think what what's you know what what's amazing to see is that you know you have had such passion for fencing throughout your entire career and, and that passion comes over hugely to everyone you coach and and also doing some part-time coaching myself I, I know quite rightly how you said about it's a new skill to learn it's a, it's a skill you have to practice to get better at it's not just as easy as and, and I would say for any athlete out there that just thinks because they're a bit good at fencing they can become a good coach it doesn't work like that it is a, a skill that requires time to practice and get better at especially when you have somebody that you is you're putting time and energy into now putting time and energy into a student um there's a lot of emotional involvement in there as well because you really care but i can't imagine what it's like when the student you're working with is your son or your daughter and this is kind of the the next part for us which is keith how with all of your fencing career and now your successful coaching career how is it then actually delivering and making your own flesh and blood the best athlete they can be without pushing them too far or getting frustrated at them or trying to live your dreams through them? That must be challenging. Yeah, it's, um, yeah being truthful, yes, it is. But when it comes to all the kids that I coach, I don't see them any differently than being truthful. My, my son and my daughter as well, they feel like my kids um, because of the, the, the time uh, we put in chatting away about it and um, personal stuff as well but also I'm not when they're having lessons I, I say to the kids as well say and um, they're paying for a lesson it's not just turn up for a lesson having it it's the, the whole thing I'm giving you a part of my life I'm investing so when I say to the kids I'm investing in you and I want you to um, like be the best you can be in order to do that we have to set the goals to uh, reach them, whatever they might be. It might be a technical goal, it might be a competition goal, it might be just personal success. But when it comes to the kids, uh, for Imogen and uh, Jamie, they're just very, very lucky kids, let's say. <laughs> uh, the reason for that is they've got everything on their doorstep. Mm. They've got, they can have lessons, they can have lessons in their house as well. Mm. I nag them, I whine at them, I moan at them as well. But I say to them, if you want something, you're going to have to work for it. One day a week, I say, if you're fencing one day a week, that's maintenance. It's having fun. It's recreational. Two days a week, yeah, you're going to get better at it as well. Three days, four days, five days, that's how the world-class fencing. The difference between uh, Great Britain and the rest of the world actually fencing right now isn't, I would say, yes, it is quite a big thing. Are you willing to train twice a day like mm. that? It can physically and mentally absorb you and mm. break you. 
But the thing is, it's being able to find the right environment to do that. When I was younger and I'd done two hour, uh, two days session away, it broke me the first time. Because I went in there 100%, bang, and I felt broken. <laughs> so, and then that's why you see uh, Richard going for a little snooze. Like mm. that, in the Liam Paul Centre and things like that. We all did. Remember, we got to lunchtime. We had our lunch and then fell asleep for an hour. Uh, an okay. hour and a half. Then we done a warm-up. And that's the thing. It's been able to get into that uh, mindset. But it's such a social game as well. There's a reason why me and you and Chris have been friends for so long as well. It's <laughs> like that social interaction. And with the kids, they love like uh, achieving but they also like the social aspect, and that's what's keeping them in the sport. And when it's coaching my kids, Imogen and Jamie, I want them to, uh, be, The good thing is, uh, I, I put my hand up now and say, I'm not the best coach, but I'm trying to be the best I can be. In order to do that, I have to continue to learn, not just uh, skills, but also learn from the pupils as well. What's working? What's not working? How do we adapt? It's not just one way, it's two ways. And that's the good thing about it, is being able to chat to my kids, being able to talk to them about what they feel they want as well, and sometimes have harsher talks than um, I sometimes can, let's say. <laughs> um, but the, like you said, some people, sometimes it works with um, like father and son and daughter coaching. Sometimes it doesn't. I feel very fortunate. I don't know if it's because um, of the certain questions that I give them or, or ask them as well to try and analyse uh, how they're feeling, how their performance is. But it's just trying to make, help them enjoy it as much as possible, really. Yeah. And what? how old are they now? Uh, Jamie's uh, 15 and Imogen's going to be 13 on tomorrow. Actually. Oh, cool. Well, happy birthday, yeah. Imogen. Yeah. Um, uh, and how long have they been getting coaching from you? Yeah, so that's the thing as well. It's putting the hours in. So Jamie's been uh, having lessons for 10 years wow. since he was five. Uh, Imogen didn't like uh, the plastic fencing. And just uh, So she, <laughs> she didn't start off when she was five. She started about uh, nine. Um, so about four, no, probably about eight actually, um, that she started actually metal fencing. And uh, they get to fence each other, and but like you said, it's just there's no magic wand, there's no special move, as we all know. It's just putting the hours in, the practice, 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 and making it purposeful as well. So when we talk about fencing, it's not just the fencing; that's just one element to it. The warm up, the speed and agility, the footwork, the mindset. It's such a psychological game. If you could, um, how many of us revolved on it? You get really angry, and you. Uh, you get a hit or the referee's not giving you a hit you expected, and you rush in again and get hit. Mm, if mm. we had this emotional control, step back, take that breath, do a chair and off and hand over your foil, have that little moment where you can reset and come back on and have the upper hand on your opponent. These are all skills that um, we should be teaching at a very young age. And um, for, luckily... I've got the opportunity to do that with uh, the kids in the club. And um, and we video uh, the matches uh, and, and try and get an emotional reaction. When we get an emotional reaction, you go, fantastic. You're getting annoyed. Why are you getting annoyed? Did that improve it or did it not? What, what can you control in that uh, environment? What should you have done? So when I look at uh, videos, everyone loves watching the videos when you win matches. We all do. But the yeah. ones when you actually learn... Is one the ones when you lose? I think it's it's quite it's quite interesting. You know, you kind of mentioned all this, and and having just done uh, a podcast with John Southfield um, a, a few weeks back now, and in his his most recent book, one of the things that that his book kind of talks about is the idea that actually parents should actively encourage their their son or daughter to get involved in fencing or any sport really, because it's not only just the 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 kind of the successes or actually lack of success that we get in sport, but it's all the kind of other life skills and soft skills that we, we learn through fencing. And I think that this is what, um, you know, certainly at Fences Club London, that is an environment, probably a bit like South Hollywood, we try to teach a, a kind of lifestyle, a well-being, a kind of 
coming in and it's going through the whole routine of being an athlete. It's not just come in, get your kit on, do a bit of fencing, maybe have a lesson, go home. It's the kind of all that, as you say, the little steps that go into making the complete athlete and, and understanding that process and that journey is in itself a huge life skill because it means that I think when they go into anything else in their life, they'll understand that there's a process to, to doing things. There's a way about going things. There's a whole routine. It's not just, oh, well, I'll just do the bits I enjoy. As you said, there's there's the bits that you don't enjoy. There's the there's the learning, emotional learning, the emotional intelligence that comes out of being an athlete or any other thing that somebody would get themselves involved in. And, and I think that's where it comes down to being a high level coach is understanding that it's not just blade and hand skill it's everything that goes with it it's the emotional support it's the competition support the tactical the and everything footwork there's so much that goes into it, it becomes a lifestyle and being able to help someone through the trials and tribulations the highs the lows the the you know when you're fatigued doing a second session knowing you might not be your best but actually being there in itself is just kind of uh, uh, the, the the main thing there and it's it's really great to see and probably what what jamie and imogen have experienced from me at a very young age and what has obviously made Jamie the, the 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 new British champion that he is now, and and I'm sure for you that must have been quite a, a special moment when he became British champion, and you having been British champion yourself, that that must have been quite a an accumulation of hours and hours and hours of hard work. Yeah, it's it's really interesting to talk about uh, life skills because the life skills that you can actually transfer from fencing into life in general are massive. That mental toughness, performing under pressure hunger to achieve, we talk about resilience, it's okay to make mistakes, we all make mistakes. And the, uh, the people skills, being able to communicate, being able to articulate how you feel is such an um, important thing to do. And also breaking barriers. So many people when uh, you go, I wish I could do this, and uh, or I want to fence Ben Peggs, or um, and going on there and feeling so nervous as well, it's breaking barriers, doing something you've never done before. And it's about planning for success. So these are all different things. We look at a whole season as well and looking at planning all that out. These are different things uh, that I speak to the kids about. And I've got unfortunate to be able to chat away to them. And it's not just on the piste, but it's when they're off it as well. I don't always talk about fencing, but what we do is we have a laugh. We talk about things and try to um, dissect them really to find out why you felt like that. Uh, why were you angry? Why did you throw your mask? Are you trying to show everybody else in the hall that you should have won that? Or you, um, it's like a, it's more internal, actually, and then just chatting away. And I feel very fortunate that the kids want to talk to me about it um, and really enjoy the sport that we're actually um, in. I think what's interesting there, so Lord Seb Coe, who was an Olympic, I think, believe Olympic gold medalist over middle distance running, he said that he was coached by his father. And actually, it was uh, it, it was really important that they had that, that, as you said, that moments of talking about the sport, the dissecting of it, the asking the tough questions. And then there was a big difference between when that was happening and the switch off period. And so, for example, you know, um, Lord Seb Coe's father would only, ref would only ever refer to him as, an athlete on the track. So it wasn't my son. It's that athlete over there. It, it never became anything. It was no different, as you said earlier on, to the other kids in the club. And actually, they decided that, it, you know, the, the journey home was to communicate and stuff about stuff that went on the track. And even when they got home, there was a brief uh, kind of time about speaking about, you know, what happened. But then after that, there became a shut off point where it was like, OK, when, you know, now that now we're back to kind of the family emotions, this is just us relaxing and being the family again that kind of we've always been. And so with that in mind, what is what does the switch off look like for you guys in, in lockdown when the fencing gets put away and the bags get packed? What's the kind of the detox time? So, yeah, when it comes to uh, probably people think that probably Jamie and Imogen are probably constantly getting uh, uh, lessons every single day in lockdown. They're kids. Yeah. They don't want lessons every single day of the week. They want to shut off. Actually, some of them, are, uh, Jamie and Imogen, actually feel bad that their friends aren't getting lessons. So they don't want lessons just now as well. Okay. So it's that more that moral side of it. And um, I was quite interested. I want them to have lessons, but am I going to put them? <laughs> no, because uh, they don't want to do it. So we're playing golf, having a laugh, playing football, um, just mucking about in the garden, building things in the garden, building plant pots, <laughs> things like that. Um, 
but it's, it, he's playing FIFA. I'm not going to stop. Right, I whine about FIFA and Xbox all the time. <laughs> How can you transfer these skills into life in general? And they're like, I'm like what would I have done when I was younger? So then yeah. I have to relate back to it and I laugh about it. I'm busy. I'm that whiny dad that goes, <laughs> why are you on your Xbox? And, but that's what he's doing. And that's what I would have done. And well, I, I'm the dad who's on the Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> so Although actually know. they do say that top surgeons do do use Xbox and stuff <laughs> to get kind of like their manipulation of, of the tools. And actually the, one of the things they found is that in a study that of elite sportsmen, those that play uh, a lot of video games actually have a more tactical based brain. So actually... It's not necessarily a bad thing, but one thing I would say, the big mistake you've made is that actually you should have got J Imogen and Jamie on the golf course from an early age because they earn a lot more money in <laughs> golf than they do in fencing. Oh, uh, I know, I know. But no, it's like, also when you're talking about the, that talk, uh, and talking is vital, and when they're on the piste, hopefully they have the tools, and I'm sure they all do, and so have the tools to perform and make the results they want. I'm not there to shout and tell them what to do and take the foil off and take and do the matches for them. It's up to them to do and make the mistakes. So when it's in the middle, uh, in the minute break, I don't shout at them and say, these are all the moves, this is what you're doing wrong, this is what you're doing right. I go, how's it going? Mm. And I want them to have that impact. Oh, this is what's happening. Okay, what do you need to do? Yeah. Are you going to do it? Here's a drink of water. <laughs> and then, do you know that blocking makes them, uh, you can do this, you can do this, you can, I think that was in, uh, was it, there was a, something in bounce about that. It's like a, a blocking strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember putting a towel over my head and saying to myself, you can do this, you can do this, you can do it. And eventually saying, you will do this, you will do this, you will do this. And eventually, I can do this. Yeah, like, yeah. That, no matter if you're 13 2 down. You can come back and do it. It's not over till it's over. I it's think I've seen you come back from 14-5 down. Yeah, I've also seen something similar. I think it was in Cairo, one of his first World Cups back, pulls that rabbit out of the bag. I was like, I'm an Elkie. Uh, you know, it's yeah, it's... for a year. and can still pull it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have good days and bad days, let's say. Uh, but it, that's the thing. It's having that pon positive. And there's nothing more um, heartbreaking when you... You can see your opponent is just filled with energy and wanting to actually basically rip your head off <laughs> and it's it's so focused and determined to beat you. And that's you like, whoa. And because your body language can take away energy away from your opponent or it can give it. Yeah. So I, so when I say to the kids, I don't want them to shout and scream. Um that's one thing I do talk about with the kids is that emotional control. I would rather be like um that stay nice and calm after the hit's okay shouting for it, but I don't uh, and uh, cheering, but then it's been able to go back and stay ice cold and focus on that hit. After the match, once you've done the job, you can cheer, you can shout like a uh, garrotzo and stuff like that, and for Coney and but it's been able to stay in control till the job is done. I don't want yeah. you whining, I don't want you complaining, I don't want you copying others uh, that have done that in the past. I want you to focus on what you need to do, and that's the type of things that I talk about with the kids. And it seems like obviously there's been a huge journey there, a lot of learning for yourself personally. But obviously these four months have been very challenging for most people uh, in the country, in the world. And is there anything that you've learned personally in lockdown that you will implement or take forward out of lockdown? When I talk about um, controlling the controllables, I cannot control uh, what's happening uh, with the a pandemic just now I have to wait for uh, guidelines and as a coach this is my job and I do not get paid if I do not coach <laughs> like that and it's worrying but then it's looking at things work out things change like that it's stay nice and calm when I've been uh, under pressure or um, panicking about something where's that ever got me mm. So what I have to do is I have to look at logically, this is what I need to do, this is how I'm going to do it, and have a plan in place. So this has also taught me to enjoy the moments that I have with the family. Enjoy the four months off. When are you ever going to get four months off? Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, true. Especially, like, uh, 
with me, I'm constantly competitions, ju- cadets, juniors, senior events, coaching from 6 30 in the morning till 7 30. I work seven days a week until uh, if I want a few days off. And now, all of a sudden, I've got four months off. I've been, able to, I've been able to work on my to-do list that I've had for 15 years. <laughs> like that. So I've, I've been being truthful. I've enjoyed the last four months. I've been able to really physically and mentally prepare myself. M- mentally, I've, I've had a few um, like problems in the past as well. And I've been able to actually just work on what I need. Mm. That's to help myself as well. Um, positive people have negative thoughts as well. But we'll be able to actually, when we realise that, it's being able to realise you're thinking negatively and flip that switch mm-hmm. like that. Trust me, we've all had negative thoughts, especially in the lockdown like that. But yeah, sure. we'll change it. But I think in more, I reflect more. I think that's the main main thing, Ben, in lockdown. And, and actually, with all that being said, what what are your kind of top tips for athletes or even other coaches in lockdown currently what can they be doing if they are struggling emotionally or or even from a training point of view what are your kind of top tips for people in lockdown right now um what i recommend as well is uh, trying to um find goals for yourself if you find goals for yourself uh, it gives you a bit of a purpose as well but also being able to that escapism and when i say that it's being able to go for a walk mm-hmm. try something new is it painting when was the last time you painted ben oh do you know what actually <laughs> I've, I've just done a project for british fencing and i've been doing all kinds of creative things i'll tell you what uh, i'm going to come out like someone from art attack after this so it's like uh, <laughs> learning a, uh, also learning like a musical instrument or going for a walk going for a run going uh, doing something a little bit different diy i think um it's just finding and giving yourself goals and I think that's really vital for me it was like fitness like um I started off a uh, lockdown at like bench pressing I think was it 55 kilos now I'm 95 kilo bench press I'm yeah, only nice. I'm only 66 kilos weight um and I'm, I'm, I'm four foot three as well is it <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm the same I'm the same height as Tom Cruise at five foot seven that's all that's what is that when you're standing on the yellow pages or is that <laughs> <laughs> that, that's great and you know it's it's so wonderful to hear. i mean it's nice if you'd asked me when was the last time i tried to learn a musical instrument i'd have probably told you that at school i got told off significantly because i i took a recorder and i used it as a lightsaber rather than actually trying to play the thing um <laughs> but i have i have been doing painting but i mean Do you know the, actually we just before lockdown we got piano in the house and uh so i don't play you know the, I, I did grade one when i was 13 but nice. it's just been so i can read a little bit but it's you know we've got like the piano for beginners book and actually every day or every other day i sit down i just do five minutes i'm like oh yeah i can play three blind mice that's all right and it you know slowly <laughs> but surely it turns into something and it's well, uh, that's quite it's quite satisfying and fun it's, it's also a skill that can evolve and that's mm. the thing there's one of these skills being able to evolve and get uh, uh, from three blind mites to Beethoven, <laughs> like that, who knows, like that. So it's been able to, I think that's a skill that you can just keeps on giving really as well. I uh, just, uh, with a quick moment here to plug my brother, if anybody wants piano lessons out there, he is doing some <laughs> online stuff. So please feel free to get in contact with Sam Peggs. We're, we're you know, we're a family of all trades. Uh, but no, I completely agree. And actually you mentioned Jemek earlier on, uh, Keith, who's obviously been quite influential in, in, in your career, uh, both as a coach and probably someone that I'm sure uh, you've taken a lot of guidance from, as well as Sean, uh, of course. But uh, Jemek, as well as putting some videos on Instagram of his of his good technical uh, kind of uh, pad work, he's also been playing piano, which is a, a beautiful skill to have. Oh, cool. I didn't know he played piano. Keith, we got a question on Twitter yesterday from... Andrew Watson. So we thought maybe you'd want to answer it. He started fencing in January of this year at the age of 48, and he's been guilty of letting his fencing slip over the past few weeks and months. What's the best way to get back into things? Finding out why you love it, first of all, as well. What do you love about this sport of fencing as well? That's what's kept us in the sport because sometimes we fall out of love with it and come back into it as well. Um, but you have to enjoy it to be able to keep on doing it. And the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it as well. So it's finding that time and having a purpose of what you're actually trying to achieve. 
but have small snippets of it as well. You won't be able to do everything at the same time as well. Uh, but it's also having a structure. So it's looking at, like, uh, the footwork is a massive element as well. But when you're actually on the piste, it's having a purpose on the piece. What are you trying to develop? Is it your attacks? Is it your defensive actions? Um, and then also lessons, of course, are vital to actually focus on the technical, the tactical uh, element as well. Yeah, absolutely. So so maybe you can get in touch with wherever he started and ask about lessons. And uh, in the meantime, you know, you watch on YouTube is always really handy and just staying active and you know, it's always a big thing as well. So it's less of a shock to the system because fencing is, is quite an awkward sport if, uh, it, you know, if you can, if you're not used to it for a while. But I like That's... that, Re reignite that flame. That's important. Yeah. I think sometimes, you know, as you say, Keith, everyone can get demotivated and there's a difference uh, between your motivation and commitment. And sometimes as the motivation fluctuates, we have to be committed to the cause, but actually sometimes taking a step back and kind of reigniting that passion that that was uh, once there is a, is a great way to kick things back off again. Um, one final thing, Keith, because um, I, uh, I know we, we've kept you for a while and, and it's been such an insightful, uh, insightful chat. Um, but it, as, a, as a quick final piece, what was your and what do you feel is your greatest achievement as a fencer? And actually also alongside that, what is your greatest achievement as a coach? Um, so it's been able to create an environment where they feel safe that it's okay to make mistakes. As that, a coach. As a coach as yeah. well. But when it comes to the greatest achievements as well, um, like scoreboard success, let's say, would be three Sal Hollerud on the, uh, the the first and two thirds at the last cadet championships. Followed by, of course, like Jamie winning the Birmingham. And he was supposed to be the water boy for me at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, that means... What, Jamie? <laughs> I tell you, your old man's going to be going to the Birmingham Open. Jamie, I've, I've won this five times in the past. It'll be okay like that. And, then, and he faced an absolute blinder to win yeah, it. Yeah, I did. At 14 years old, when the youngest ever to win a senior big Open. Um, so there's many, many cooks on that trophy now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, his old man, and uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> I, you know, I rem I remember talking to some of the Scottish boys about so when Jamie was first allowed to compete at Opens, which was at the age of thirteen, you know, and some of the Scottish boys were saying, yeah, man, he's getting better every competition. Only fence, he was only fencing in Scotland, you know, small local events, uh, and he kept drawing the same guy, and he was like. I can still just about beat him, but every competition the score gets closer, and soon he's going to overtake me. <laughs> it's gonna, I'm gonna, my score's going to go down. His going to go down. <laughs> yeah, it's just putting them in an environment where um, they're always learning. So I don't want them to go into tournaments where they're always winning. Mm. That's not my philosophy at all in the sport. It's about making them grow. It's making them uh, learn. And in order to do that, I put them in environments where they're going to find it tough. And these are the, the biggest lessons in life as well, the ones that you, you lose. And so people said, Keith, you're probably putting them into opens too early. And I said, why? Is it the physical ability or is it his technical ability? Or is it just his age? And I said, you, you'll soon find out because he's beaten all the uh, members of uh, Sal Hollywood and he was close to me and now he's absolutely whooping me. Um, <laughs> but um, it's about getting them out there. So when they're cadets, they should be doing juniors. When they're juniors, they should be doing seniors in satellites. And it's getting them just to step up that extra time as well. It might be looks like it's way out of sight, but this is what you're striving for. Mm. Don't be in an environment where you're the best there. It means you have to move out that environment. You want to be around people that are better than you to actually develop you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Keith, it's been it's been so insightful and a, and a lot of fun. And, you know, um, I'm, uh, uh, you know, uh, South Hollywood's uh, a great club and I'm very much looking forward to hopefully coming up and seeing you this summer. And the next time I'll be fencing you guys, I'll probably be a veteran by then. <laughs> so I'll be up to 10 points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. 10, that's the break, right? Yeah. <laughs> we'll get the defibrillator on standby just in case you know yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no i'm looking forward to it mate absolutely so uh, but yeah it's been a lot of fun and, and thank you very much and, and for those that are in scotland um or, or even anywhere in the country actually and they're looking for looking to, to to get in contact with keith as a coach or, or the club that can be found on 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 instagram um or on facebook um as well as the the web link uh, isn't that right keith yep on keith cook 81 
That's it. Excellent. Cool. Well, I think that's that's all from us. And um, Chris, where can we be found? So in the meantime, while we're waiting for the next episode, uh, you can find us on Google, Apple, Spotify, YouTube and Transistor. So make sure to subscribe, review and get in touch with more questions. Uh, and on Twitter, we are at Fenced In Podcast. Thanks very much, guys. Yeah, okay, thanks for having me. No, great to have you. Bye. 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 The Fenced In Podcast has been created in association with J4G Design, your one-stop user experience agency for all things digital, websites, graphic design, and technical support.